Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you. Hope you're safe. Hope you're safe. Please be constant in prayer. Look to the Lord. Trust in Him. Because no matter what happens, nothing can take our reward from us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We are continuing our study <clears throat> of Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. Listen, as I've stated to you, Matthew 24 and verse 34 has caused Bible students, I mean fits, because it, when you have a literalistic, materialistic, physical concept of the coming of the Lord on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and then you come to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34, there's no doubt whatsoever. That's troubling. <clears throat> Little anecdote here. Uh, my father was deeply, deeply troubled about Matthew chapter 24. And oh, by the way, my seminary and uh, professors were deeply troubled by it as well. But on Sunday afternoons when I was just a kid, it was regular practice for my father, brother-in-law, and two brothers to gather in, in a side room uh, of the house and have Bible study. And so very often, Matthew chapter 24 was the subject of discussion. I used to hear my father, I was kind of forced to attend, you know, those studies. I was really a young guy, wanted to be out catching crawdads and tadpoles and throwing rocks and stuff like that. But anyway, I was very often forced to attend. And I remember my father saying, I know that Matthew 24, 29 to 31, talks about the coming of the Lord. But verse 34 said it was going to be in that generation. I know it didn't happen in that generation. I just don't know what the answer is. Unfortunately, my father passed away before I had the opportunity to share with him what I think is the proper view. And he would have embraced it immediately because he would have seen the linguistic harmony. He would have seen the contextual harmony. He would have seen the biblical harmony of understanding the language of coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory as a metaphor. He would have seen that immediately. He just didn't have, have time, but that's okay. So what I've been sharing with you is that there's simply no way linguistically, there is no way contextually, there is simply no way that it is proper to take the term this generation to refer to a kind of people, to refer to procreation, to refer to anything other than all of the people living at a given point of time, just like we use the term today. When people, as I've heard many say, well, this generation has never seen anything like this. Do we mean this kind of people has never seen anything like this? Do we mean this wicked, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, this, this particular group of people uh, who are procreating has never seen anything like this? No, that's, I mean, it's just ridiculous, really, honestly. So let me drive point, this home point I shared with you yesterday, Matthew 16, 27, and 28. Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 10, 22, and 23. Jesus warned his apostles there, just as he did in the Olivet Discourse, that they were going to be hated by all men for his name's sake. But he said, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now watch this. When they persecute you in this city, now mind you, he is sending them out to preach. When they persecute you in this city, what are they being persecuted for? For preaching. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Do what? Flee. Assuredly, I say to you, well, guess what? That's the little term, amen, lego, who mean? What does amen, lego, who mean mean? Well, Amin Lego Humin calls attention to what is about to be said to emphasize what has just been said or what has just been said. You're going to be hated. They're going to persecute you. They're going to chase you from city to city. 
But verily I say unto you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel. Well, why were they going to be going through the cities of Israel? Because they're fleeing from persecution. Fleeing from persecution. But, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, listen carefully to what I'm about to say, Jesus was saying, because even though they're going to hate you, even though they're going to persecute you, even though they're, they're, go they're going to chase you from city to city, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, once again, we're dealing with a verse that has given scholars fits. Men such as Albert Schweitzer, even David Strauss, and a host of others, they say, well, well, pretty clearly, Jesus didn't come before <clears throat> before the apostles had fled through all the cities of Israel. And so David Strauss became a raving skeptic. Albert Schweitzer said there's no question whatsoever that Jesus expected his coming to put an end to the world in time uh, in the lifetime of the apostles. But, of course, we know it didn't happen. Rudolf Bultmann said every schoolboy every school knows that Jesus predicted his coming to put an end to the world. In his lifetime, or in the, in the lifetime of the first century generation, every schoolboy knows he failed. Well, if we take, if we take the futurist view of eschatology, and that is that Jesus predicted that he was going to come back as a five-foot-five Jewish man in a physical body riding a literal, literal cumulus cloud out of heaven at the so-called end of time, then yes, he failed. And so these scholars that I've mentioned, and many, many more, <clears throat> they basically refuse to give up on their literalistic, materialistic, I would say carnal and physical, Concepts of the Day of the Lord. But I would suggest to you that Colin Brown, in his Dictionary of New Testament Theology, offered the solution to the problem that many, many, many scholars have now adopted. And that is, Brown took note of the fact that the conundrum, the problem of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34 is easily solved when we understand that the language of the coming of the Lord on the clouds of heaven of Matthew chapter 24, 29 and, and following is metaphoric language which had always been used in the Old Testament to speak of God's sovereign actions in history to use one nation to judge another. It's not end of time. It is not end of the world language. And he was right. <laughs> I mean, Colin Brown was right. When you understand the language of the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds with power and great glory, with the angels and flaming fire, with the shout, with the trumpet, etc., etc., when you understand that is not language that was intended to be taken literally, then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we've got the perfect solution for understanding Matthew 24, verse 34, literally, prosaically, and we don't have to change its definition. We don't have to twist it and distort it and pervert it which is precisely what futurists have to do. We've got more for you, so I'll see you on the flip side.